Welcome to this video. This is going to be a short video in which we're going to discuss type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. And the way in which we're going to do this is we're going to use three examples of respiratory conditions, namely pneumonia, asthma and COPD. And we're going to look at each of these conditions and which type of respiratory failure they will more commonly give rise to. And through those examples, I hope that you'll gain some sort of understanding of the difference between type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure and the difference in the mechanism uh, by which someone goes into each of these. So we'll start off with pneumonia, which is more likely to cause type 1 respiratory failure. So firstly, let's just make sure everyone understands what pneumonia is. So we'll have a quick picture of the lungs here. So this is representing the right lung and this is representing the left lung here. So the first condition we're discussing is pneumonia. And this pen is a little bit thick. I might just thin it out to the um, thinner one. There we go. Pneumonia. So pneumonia means infection of the actual lung tissue and usually it is reasonably focal. So we can draw pneumonia quite simply like this. So we'll say this patch of lung here is infected with some sort of bacteria and the main bacteria that causes pneumonia is a form of streptococcus called streptococcus pneumoniae. Spelt like so. Um, and so this patch of lung we're going to assume here is infected with strep pneumoniae, so this individual has pneumonia, in this case, right basal pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is more likely to cause type 1 respiratory failure as opposed to type 2 respiratory failure. So let's start by talking about what the difference between type 1 and type 2 is. So think about what respiratory failure means. It means that the lungs are failing to do their job. Now, what is the job of the respiratory system? What is the job of the lungs? It is gas exchange. It is to supply the blood with oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are the two key jobs of the lungs. And this is where the difference between type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure comes in. In type 1 respiratory failure, the lungs fail to oxygenate the blood adequately. So the arterial blood that has come through the lungs and is going to go back to the heart. Um, so if we um, imagine the arterial blood that's now coming through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium of the heart, it's going to go into the left ventricle and is going to be pumped into the systemic circulation, the aorta, uh, which we can imagine is here on the drawing. Um, this is the arterial blood. If the oxygen level in that arterial blood is too low, but the carbon dioxide level is fine, then that is what we call type 1 respiratory failure. So I suppose a less pretentious way of saying type 1 respiratory failure is just to call it hypoxia. Indeed, these two things mean effectively the same thing. If the oxygen level is too low in the arterial blood, but the carbon dioxide level is okay, then that's type 1 respiratory failure. So type 1 respiratory failure, quite simply hypoxia. Type 2 respiratory failure is proper respiratory failure. It is where both the oxygen and the carbon dioxide are not right. So oxygen is going to be too low and carbon dioxide is going to be too high. So you're going to have hypercapnia and hypoxia in type 2 respiratory failure. So when both of them are together, that is type 2 respiratory failure. However, lots of times... Um, now, well, how can I say this best? So, when people come into hospital, we can very easily measure the oxygen levels in their blood. We have these fantastic things called pulse oximeters now, uh, which is a little probe that you put on the finger. It looks kind of like this. Um, that's a very crude picture. Someone puts their finger in there and it works very, very fancy. They, it um, shines light through their finger and by the absorption of different frequencies or different wavelengths of light, it can work out what the saturation of the haemoglobin is in the blood. So it can work out how much of the oxygen binding sites uh, that are available in haemoglobin within the blood are actually filled with oxygen. So it can work out your oxygen saturation in your arterial blood, which will abbreviate to SO2 for short. Uh, and I suppose if we were being... Uh, proper, we would call it SAO2 for saturation in the arterial blood of oxygen. 
So we can very easily work out how much oxygen people have in their blood. Now, if someone comes into hospital and their oxygen saturation is low, what the nurses instantly do is they strap on oxygen onto this person. They will either put nasal cannula, so they'll put a little tube that goes on the person. So if I just draw a quick picture of this, if this is someone's head, here's their nose, then we can put a little sort of tube like this that has sort of like little bits coming off it that go into each of the nostrils and the air oxygen is delivered through the tube into these two little pipes into the person's nostrils and then it will be attached to um, a, tu uh, you know, a tap on the wall where oxygen is coming out if they turn it on. So they can, this is called a nasal cannula, this is one way of delivering oxygen. So when we do this, um, that's going to increase the amount of oxygen that someone is inspiring and then they can very easily then correct. This will bring up the oxygen level in their blood usually and I'll explain this more in depth later. But the point, the reason that I'm bringing this up now is that they will often have corrected the, ox the hypoxic component of type 2 respiratory failure. It's very easy to correct the hypoxic component of type 2 respiratory failure. You just stick someone on supplemental oxygen so because usually of course when you're breathing in normal air, you're breathing in 21% oxygen. So if you raise the percentage of oxygen that you're breathing in by giving someone supplemental oxygen, you can raise this number hugely. Indeed, some of the more high-tech um, ways of delivering oxygen can raise this, you know, well into the 90s. This nasal cannula can't raise it up into 90s, but other forms of other ways we can deliver supplemental oxygen that I'll talk about maybe later, uh, they can raise the... Um, FiO2, the fraction of oxygen that you're inspiring, so fraction of inspired oxygen, um, they can raise it up extremely high and therefore you can easily correct the hypoxic component of type 2 respiratory failure. Now it's much much more difficult to measure carbon dioxide level in the arterial blood. For that you have to get an arterial sample of blood. You have to stick a needle into someone's artery. Now most blood tests obviously are from veins. We don't usually stick needles into, the, into arteries because it hurts a lot more than sticking it into a vein. However if someone is in respiratory distress then we do do this fancy blood test where we take blood from the radial artery uh, and it's called an ABG blood test, arterial blood gas, um, and we can then find out what the CO2 level is in their arterial blood. So we can measure that. Now, putting someone on supplemental oxygen, it might correct the oxygen, it might correct hypoxia, but it's not going to do anything for correcting the hypercapnia, the too high CO2 level in the blood. And therefore, often, you will see people where their oxygen level is normal, so they're not hypoxic, but they are hypercapnic. This still counts as type 2 respiratory failure, and it is quite common to see that. And the reason is that when they arrive in hospital, they will have instantly had oxygen strapped to them. In fact, probably even before they arrived in hospital, because the ambulance staff will have um, attached oxygen to them. And therefore, their hypoxia will have been corrected, but the hypercapnia has not been corrected. Therefore, often, you will just see hypercapnia, and that counts as type 2 respiratory failure. So that was what all of this was in aid of discussing. The reason that you will often just see hypercapnia uh, in type 2 respiratory failure, because the hypoxia has been corrected. So to summarise what I've just said, if you've just got hypoxia, that is type 1 respiratory failure. That is really if you like, not proper respiratory failure. Because, you know, if the lungs are truly failing, respiratory failure, then both of these things should be failing. You know, you should be hypoxic and hypercapnic in true respiratory failure. So type 1 respiratory failure, I always think of it as not proper respiratory failure. It's hypoxia, really. Whereas type 2 respiratory failure is proper respiratory failure. Your, your lungs are truly failing to do their job. You've got both hypoxia and hypercapnia. Although, as I say, in hospital, the hypoxia will usually be being, being corrected by supplemental oxygen. So you'll just see on the ABG the hypercapnia. Right, so let's go back to discussing specific examples because I feel like this will be a lot clearer when we're discussing specific examples. So let's discuss pneumonia. So here we have a portion of infected tissue. Now when this tissue is infected, it's not going to do its job. So this very big lump of lung here is not going to do its job. So you're not going to get gas, you know, you're not going to get air being ventilated into here because it's full of inflammatory exudate and full of bug. Um, so this part of the lung is not going to be ventilated, so it's not going to be helping with gas exchange. However, think about this. 
all of the blood coming from the pulmonary artery. So remember, the right ventricle is about here on our drawing. In fact, I might even put a great big red splodge there for the heart. Um, so here's the heart here, just that I've got something to point to now. Um, so the right ventricle is roughly here, and it will be supplying the lungs with blood. It'll Off will come the pulmonary trunk, it'll spit into the right pulmonary artery, the left pulmonary artery, and those will spit into a huge number of different vessels. And blood will still be coming to this portion of the lung, and then it will be going into the pulmonary venous system, and then going to the left ventricle, uh, left atrium, left ventricle, and being pumped into the aorta. So blood is still being pumped through this bit, but there's no ventilation to this bit because it's bogged up with the pneumonia. Therefore, all of that blood that's going through there is not going to be having oxygen put into it, and it's not going to be having the carbon dioxide taken out of it. And then it's going to be being mixed with the blood that's coming from all the rest of the lungs. Now, the blood that's going to the rest of the lungs from the pulmonary system is going to be oxygenated and is going to have the carbon dioxide removed. So it's going to be fine, but now we're going to get mixing of this blood. And that is going to, it, you can imagine, it's going to mean that overall the blood that's arriving in the left atrium and then going into the left ventricle is going to be a mixture of this blood that has had the correct thing happen to it. It has been oxygenated and has had carbon dioxide removed and it's going to have this bit that hasn't had the correct thing happen. So it's going to not have had oxygen added and it's not going to have the carbon dioxide removed. Now you might think, well surely that is going to result in hypoxia and hypercapnia, but the reality is that usually just results in hypoxia and let me explain why. Now, for this, we need to talk about ABGs and VBGs. So these are blood tests that we do in hospitals. We have very fancy machines that are often in like, man, that's an awful picture, but they're very temperamental machines. So they probably deserve a terrible picture. But here's a machine and you can attach on. So here's the port. You can take a little sample of blood. So here is, let's say, a syringe. We've taken the sample of blood. Um, from the patient, you can put attach this syringe onto this machine and it can work out what the concentration or the partial pressure we often talk about when we're dealing with gases, uh, but really you can think of that as just the concentration because a partial, it's all based on physical chemistry and based on the idea that, you know, if you had um, a container, like so, with some fluid, and we're imagining that fluid now is blood, so here's the blood here, um, it's about what partial pressure of the gas would you have to have in this air above the fluid to get a certain concentration of the um, gas dissolved in the blood here. So when we talk about this blood here having a partial pressure of CO2, really what it, what it actually has is it has carbon dioxide dissolved in it at a certain concentration, but that concentration is the concentration that you would get if in this gas above it, the partial pressure of CO2 was equal to this. So that's why instead of talking about concentrations, we talk about partial pressures um, when we're talking about carbon dioxide and oxygen, even though really they're concentrations in the blood. But it's, it means the partial pressure that you'd have to have in gas above the blood, if we had a little container containing gas and blood, what partial pressure would you have to have here to get that same concentration? Uh, within dissolved in the blood. So if you have a partial pressure of six millimeters of mercury of carbon dioxide in the blood, that means that you've got a concentration here that you would get if you put six millimeter of mercury partial pressure of CO2 in this gas up here. Hope that's clear. Um, anyway, so um, we can take arterial samples or venous samples and attach them to this machine and it can tell us what the concentration or the partial pressure as we've just discussed of carbon dioxide and what the partial pressure of oxygen is dissolved in that blood. Now, a little bit of complicated, a complicating factor of oxygen. Carbon dioxide is incredibly simple because you just have the carbon dioxide molecules dissolved in the blood. So you just have them sort of dissolved within the fluid of the blood. Oxygen's more complicated because you have oxygen dissolved within the blood. So you have a partial pressure of oxygen, but you also have the oxygen that's attached to the haemoglobin molecules. Now, depending on what the partial pressure, i.e. the concentration of oxygen dissolved in the blood is, that will determine the saturation of the haemoglobin binding sites. So if we just draw a 
red blood cell and unfortunately I'm drawing it in blue which is a really bad colour choice but ignore the colouring. So here's a red blood cell. We know that it's full of haemoglobin molecules so here this little square can represent a haemoglobin molecule. That has binding sites. Uh, each haemoglobin molecule has binding site and I can't actually remember biochemically how many binding sites each haemoglobin molecule has which is really bad but each haemoglobin molecule I think it might just be one. Do they each have one heme group attached to them? I can't remember, but each hemoglobin molecule has binding sites for oxygen. One, two, whatever the number is, it doesn't matter. The point is oxygen binds to hemoglobin. And when we talk about the PO2, that means that not the co that's effectively referring to the concentration of oxygen that's dissolved in the blood. It's not. Ref you then also have all the oxygen that's attached to the hemoglobin. That is... Uh, encoded, you know, the, the piece of information that tells us what that is, is the saturation of the haemoglobin, so SO2, um, and this one will determine, this one, they'll be related to one another, so the higher the concentration of oxygen in the blood, the more of the haemoglobin sites will be occupied, i.e. the higher the saturation, so they're related to one another, so when you oxygenate your blood, you increase the PO2, the concentration of oxygen dissolved in it, and then those oxygen molecules, a lot of them will load onto the uh, haemoglobin molecules, so you'll have a huge amount of oxygen also being carried on the haemoglobin molecules, but they'll be related to one another. The higher you get your co concentration of oxygen dissolved in the blood, the higher will be your saturation of the haemoglobin molecules. Now, I was talking about ABGs versus VBGs, so you can take arterial gas and you can take venous gas, so uh, you can take venous blood, arterial blood, you can run it through this and find out what the arterial concentrations of oxygen and the arterial concentrations of CO2 are, so we'll go back to uh, white, so we can work out what these things are, we can then work out what the oxygen saturation in arterial blood is, we can then take a venous sample of blood and we can get the PV CO2 PaCO2, oh, sorry, ignore me, the PVO2 and the SVO2. So the machine will tell you all of these numbers if you take an arterial sample and a venous sample. Now here's the really important thing. Oxygen partial pressures differ hugely between arterial versus venous blood. This one is usually uh, above 10 millimetres of mercury. So it's a big, big number, whereas this one can be really low. It can be maybe three, maybe even lower than that millimetres of mercury. The point is, the numbers, the specific numbers, it's not important to know the specific numbers. The message I'm trying to deliver to you is that there is a big drop between oxygen concentration in the arterial blood and oxygen concentration in the venous blood, and there is a corresponding massive drop between the oxygen saturation of haemoglobin in the arterial blood and the oxygen saturation in venous blood. And anyone who's ever done an ABG and missed the artery and ended up in a vein and got a VBG by accident and then gone and run it uh, will be aware of this fact because you then end up getting an oxygen saturation potentially of something like 20%. And you're thinking, well, either the patient's going to die very, very quickly or is going to be dead by the time I get back uh, or I've managed to put the needle into a vein, not the artery that I intended to put it into. Uh, so there is a massive difference between oxygen content of the arterial blood and oxygen concentration of the venous blood. However, with regards to CO2, the difference is much more modest. The venous CO2 is obviously going to be higher than the arterial CO2 because the peripheral tissues are going to be putting in carbon dioxide as a waste product into the venous blood. However, it is not that much higher. If you do a VBG and an ABG, you will find that there is a very modest difference between the arterial CO2 content and the venous CO2 content. So this one might be, let's say, 5 millimetres of mercury, and this one might be 6 millimetres of mercury. In fact, that's even quite a steep difference. Often you might find it even smaller than that. This one might be... Um, uh, 5 and this one might be 5.5 millimetres of mercury. So there's a very small difference between the concentration of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood and venous blood. Now why have I spent so much time explaining that to you? Because now I can justify why pneumonia is really only going to give rise to type 1 respiratory failure. So let's talk through it again. So the right ventricle is here, it's pumping blood into the pulmonary artery, uh, into the pulmonary arterial system, 
and some of that blood is going through this diseased portion of lung, it's not going to be oxygenated, it's not going to get rid of its CO2, and then it's going to be mixed with all the blood coming from the rest of the lungs that has been oxygenated and has had the CO2 taken off it. Now that blood that's coming from here is going to have a massively reduced oxygen concentration. It's going to have a much lower uh, PV, CO it's going to have a much lower PO2 and it's going to have a much lower SO2, these values here, the values of the venous uh, blood. And it's now going to be mixed with the blood coming from the rest of it and that is going to produce a significant enough drop in the overall PO2 and SO2 of blood that's coming into the left atrium and then the left ventricle. So it is going to result, therefore, in hypoxia, a reduction in your PaO2 and SaO2. However, as I've spent a long time telling you, there is not that much difference between arterial and venous CO2 concentrations. So when you tip this blood back into the blood that's coming from all the rest of the healthy lung, yes, it's going to raise the CO2 content a little bit, but usually not significantly enough to actually produce hypercapnia of the arterial blood that's then going to be pumped around the body. So you usually don't get significant enough hypercapnia to actually count it as hypercapnia. Uh, and therefore you just get hypoxia, and that is type 1 respiratory failure. So, how do you then treat this? Well, you treat it simply with supplemental oxygen. And this is why the difference between type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure matters, because you treat it in different ways. If the problem is just hypoxia, then the solution is much simpler. You can just give that person supplemental oxygen. If you get them to breathe in a much higher oxygen concentration, then all of the air going into their alveoli, all over the healthy parts of their lung, is going to have a much higher oxygen concentration. Therefore, the PO2 that the blood is going to have that's being exposed to this air is going to be much higher. And then when you mix it together with this blood coming from here, they can cancel each other out effectively. So let's just talk a bit more about supplemental oxygen. So nasal cannula is the first step. This is mild supplemental oxygen. You can deliver up to about four litres per minute of 100% oxygen for a nasal cannula. Now, of course, you breathe, your tidal volume or your minute ventilation is going to be higher than four litres. The amount of air you breathe in in a minute is going to be higher than four litres. So you're not going to be breathing in 100% oxygen, you're just going to be mixing this air that's, you know, this oxygen that's coming in through the nasal cannula with air that you're breathing in from the surroundings. And overall, it's going to mean that the inspired content, inspired percentage of oxygen is going to be higher than 21%. But it's not going to mean it's 100%, certainly not. Uh, but it is going to raise the FiO2. Now, um, there are higher up forms of supplemental oxygen. You can put someone on an oxygen mask, so you can put a mask on their face, so it's usually kind of a, like a triangle shape, and then you can connect this to the wall, and you can put up to 15 litres per minute through that, um, and then the, you know, 15 litres is much more than you breathe in in a minute, so then you're going to raise the FiO2 higher. The higher you uh, have the flow of oxygen through this tube, the higher the FiO2 is going to be. Uh, so this would just be called an oxygen mask. Uh, the problem with doing this is that oxygen, the oxygen that comes out of the taps that we have in the walls of hospitals is just pure oxygen. It's not humidified uh, and it's usually quite cold. And if you keep someone on one of these oxygen masks, one, it's not very pleasant because it's going to um, you know, it's cold and it's dry, what you're putting through, but also it does cause problems with the nasal mucosa. Um, all that cold air that's coming in at a very high rate uh, and is unhumidified, because normal air that you breathe in at least has some humidity, um, all that cold, dry air that you're breathing in, it's going to irritate, it's going to dry out the nasal mucosa and it ends up causing nosebleeds. So if you leave people on this long term, it causes nosebleeds. So what we do instead is we have something called OptiFlow. So if someone's got a really high 
um, oxygen requirement for supplemental oxygen, so they've got quite bad pneumonia, and you can't just make do with nasal cannula, because usually if you're just doing low flow oxygen, usually that doesn't result in nosebleeds in the way that high flow oxygen would. But if they are still not, you know, they're still not maintaining a good uh, oxygen saturation with that supplemental oxygen, then you do need to go to higher flow oxygen. And you can't leave them on just a normal oxygen mask. So we have this machine called OptiFlow. And again, it actually looks like an upgraded version of the nasal cannula. It looks like this, uh, but it's much thicker. The tube is much thicker because the flow is going to be much higher. Uh, but it goes into the nose and it, it, this time is not just attached to the wall. There's a whole machine that comes with it that takes oxygen out of the wall and then has a tube that goes to the patient over here. Uh, and as I say, it, there's it's a tube that then has two bits that go up into their nose. This is an awful picture, but it's just giving you the basic idea. Uh, and this machine humidifies the oxygen. It also warms it up. So it means that people can stay on this much, much longer. And we can deliver huge rates of oxygen through this. It can go up to ridiculous levels, like 50 to 60 litres. So you can give them huge levels of supplemental oxygen. And you can actually get it to the point where uh, their FiO2 might be nearing 100% because all they're breathing in is coming from the OptiFlow machine rather than the surrounding air. So that's a brief description of supplemental oxygen. It is how we treat type 1 respiratory failure and an example of a condition that will cause type 1 respiratory failure is focal pneumonia. The key thing is that it is focal. Uh, and again, just to go over it, supplemental oxygen will help because if they're breathing in a much higher FiO2 into their lungs over here, then the PO2, the partial pressure of oxygen that's going to be in that blood that's coming from the pulmonary veins of all the healthy blood of, of, of all the healthy uh, parts of the lungs. If we draw this here, here is all the blood coming back to the left atrium from the lungs. I'm drawing it red because it's now oxygenated and has had the carbon dioxide removed. This blood that's coming from the healthy parts of the lungs and going to the left atrium here, here, um, this is now going to have a much higher PO2 than it would have normally. And therefore, when it mixes with this bit, with the blood coming from here, which I'll draw in blue because it hasn't been oxygenated, now, this has a really low PO2, these have really high PO2, so overall it will mix together and the hope is that you'll get a normal PO2 and that the oxygen saturation, the haemoglobin will normalise as well because um, even though this bit didn't ha hasn't been oxygenated, so it had a really low oxygen saturation, when these bits mix with it, because there's so much oxygen dissolved in the blood from these bits, all that oxygen that was dissolved in the blood can then load onto the haemoglobin molecules that weren't loaded that were coming from here and the hope is that it all normalizes out and you can correct the hypoxia thus. Um, so that's how we treat type 1 respiratory failure or how we treat hypoxia because this isn't really proper type respiratory failure. Type 2 respiratory failure is proper respiratory failure. That's what's going to happen in asthma and COPD when the whole of the lungs are broken. Uh, in this case, only part of the lungs are broken, whereas in asthma and COPD, the whole of the lungs are going to be broken. Um, so we'll have a break there and in the next video, we'll talk about type 2 respiratory failure.